now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. As we reported earlier, the Chinese government is cracking down on human rights attorneys in China. They contend that the attorneys are enriching themselves and attacking the party. More than 200 lawyers and their associates have been detained, with 20 still in custody. My next guest is no stranger to China's treatment of human rights defenders. Blind since infancy and known to many as the barefoot lawyer, he became an advocate for tens of thousands of Chinese who had no voice of their own. A fierce opponent of China's one-child policy, his escape from house arrest to the American embassy in Beijing made international headlines. I recently sat with him to talk about his fight for human rights, the future of China, and what life is like now for him in the United States. My exclusive interview with Chen Guangcheng. I wanted to start with your childhood. You were rendered blind at six months old due to a fever. You really communed with nature a great deal as a young boy. What did nature teach you? Well, actually, the, my interest in human rights originated from my interaction with nature, which is human beings that should be allowed to live freely as they are. But what I saw uh, in China at that time, and still perhaps today, that the human rights were abused by the regime, and I want to uh, switch those unnatural rule over human beings back to nature, which is the way, the state of nature itself. Mm -hmm. now, now, I want to delve into this a bit more, particularly the one-child policy passed and supported by this regime. How were you sensitized to it personally? I mean, you began to speak to people in the surrounding villages and in your own village. Tell me what you learned. From what I know, what I learned, uh, what I heard, what I saw, that uh, no single person in China say they would accept such a kind of one-child policy. And under the authoritarian rule of the communist regime, that they just apply all the uh, laws regardless of any human rights. And so the ordinary people were silent in face of such a kind of ruthless uh, policy implementation and enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, you and your wife violated this one-child policy by having your second child. Um, tell me, were you afraid when you did this? I mean, these, these authorities were clearly in the village and taking notes. These local officials wanted to punish us and suppress us. Yeah, and in the very beginning, I realized that if I dig into the problem of the one-child policy, the forced abortion issues in China, I know the risk and the dangers ahead, because it is untouchable to many, many people in China who realize the same dangerous situation that they would face if they do this. But I still want to do the right thing, even though I may have to cope with such a kind of uh, brutality from the regime. And you file a class action lawsuit, essentially, in the Shandong province. The authorities were not happy. What happened to you specifically in the wake of that filing? In the very beginning, the local officials had no idea of dealing with our class action lawsuit. So they reported to the higher level government. And after that, they just took off those ruthless actions against us. I can give you an example. During the six months period in my hometown, Lingyi County, and there were about 100 30,000 women were enforced uh, abortion, which affect more than 600,000 family members. And some of them died of such a kind of brutality and beating and th those kind of things. There are many, many complaints from those people affected by this kind of large scales, abuse of power and forced abortion to the provincial and higher ranking offices, but they were all silenced and they were all forbidden from the media reporting 
and the other local prosecutor's office not to take any actions on this. And you, you were personally abducted, put under house arrest, beaten during this period after you, after you filed this lawsuit. Did you consider giving up at that point? Yeah. Me and my family were threatened with death. Said if anything went wrong with the policy, uh, one child policy issues because of the exposure of the abuse, and you are the first would be persecuted, all your family members will be subject to persecution as well. I know also that the bottom line of those regime, the communist regime, who would do all evil things against innocent people if I give up. Mm -hmm. In 2006, they finally arrest you and sentence you to four years in prison. Now, these are trumped up charges on uh, damaging property and organizing a mob. What did you learn about yourself and about the regime? while in prison for those four years? Well, the biggest lesson, I would say, is that you would never put any hope on the communist regime in China. It is a regime without any morality or ethical, political discipline, without any regard to human rights for the people they claim to represent. Finally, in 2010, they return you back to your home, after this period in prison. You tried several times to break out. You weren't successful until t t 2012. Why did you decide that was the moment to try to break out? Well, for nearly a year that I've been planning to break through, but failed again and again until 2012, with, I would say, blessing from the above, that I made it. After I was released from prison, I was put on house arrest with even tighter control with a number of government officials stay in my house in order to control me and put me on the house arrest without any legal support. They really laid traps around this house. This wasn't an easy escape. I mean, it's really miraculous, as you said, that you, that you escaped. I mean, you, you, you scaled a wall, you fall and break your foot, you must have thought, maybe I should go back at this point. <laughs> there is no such a word as no in my life, even since when I was a child. There must be something that I can do to overcome those obstacles in life. Otherwise, they will be there if I retreat. So my life is full of determination. You finally make it to the United States Embassy in Beijing after much Travail. There's car chases and you're jumping over things and it's amazing that you made it. <laughs> but you, you hit the U.S. Embassy and it appears, at least in the beginning, that everybody is supporting you. Then what happened? Uh, in the very beginning, that I was uh, very, very pleased to see that everybody in the embassy supportive. But the second night when I was in the Beijing embassy, which was early in the morning, uh, 6 o'clock around Eastern Time, U.S., when the president here held an emergency meeting with his staff, say something like, oh, human rights should not interfere with U.S.-China relations as a whole. It is a pity that I learned later during the meeting and someone said that democratic China is not in the interest of the United States after all. Mm -hmm. you, you must have been shocked. I mean, they come to you, they make this, these announcements, they take your cell phone, which is your only means of communication. What did you think at that moment? Mm. Yes, I was very, very heartbroken, actually. Following the meeting, that their way of treating me has made a dramatic change. And they not only took away my cell phone, but also cut off my internet connection and would not allow me to visit internet anymore. You must have been petrified when the State Department officials suggest that you go out of the U.S. Embassy to a Chinese hospital to be reunited with your family. I was very shocked. They already suggested that on May the 1st, but I refused. 
I said there must be a kind of agreement reached between U.S. and China on my conditions that otherwise I wouldn't go anywhere. When I say no to the U.S. suggestions, they talk with the Chinese side. And Chinese side, what happened to Mr. Chen? He said no to your request. And then the Chinese official said, OK, we're going to bring their family here to be united with him. The, the, the U.S. was really pressuring you to take the Chinese deal, which was to remain in China, study at a Chinese university. They were, the, the United States Embassy pressured you to take that deal, yes? Yeah, it's true that uh, U.S. officials pressed me to leave the embassy compound, but whether they want me to stay in China or not, I'm not sure at that time. I also originally assumed that if the U.S. officials pressed the Chinese side to accept the condition that they would respect human rights in China. I would perhaps stay in China and go on with the human rights work as the way that I've been doing for quite a number of years. And from the hospital, you made contact with the Congress, with Chris Smith's committee, and there was that famous phone call where they held the phone call up to the, to the microphone, and we all could hear your voice. I suggest the U.S. Embassy officials on April 30th, the night in Beijing, that I would talk with U.S. government officials, including Frank Wolf and Chris Smith and Nancy Pelosi, and, but, they, but I would refuse at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to get clarity on something here. In Hillary Clinton's memoir that was released last year, she writes that as Secretary of State, she and her staff, quote, had done what Chen wanted every step of the way, end quote. Did they? Well, I was looking forward to meet then the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, but she never showed up. I really want to talk to her at, at that time in the embassy. And I was told later that only after I left the embassy, U.S. embassy compound, that I would be able to get a chance to talk over the phone with uh, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton. I'm also grateful to Hillary Clinton for her agreement to let me into the U.S. compound in Beijing at that time, critical moment. But I also put every piece of fact in my memoir book, The Barefoot Lawyer which is 100 percent true. So, so, in fact, they did not do everything that you wanted them to do. You, you had to fight to get them to do what you wanted them to do. Uh, sure. Yes, I really try hard, hard to get what I wanted at that mm -hmm. time. And you finally come to the United States. NYU offered you a scholarship. Um, tell me what happened there. A year later, NYU basically said, we're not, we're not doing this anymore. Do you believe they were pressured by the Chinese government? Yes, for sure. That's true. At that time, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Campbell brought with him a letter of invitation from NYU president, which is a three-year invitation. So I would say that I'm 100 percent sure that the communist regime in China pressed NYU to move further. Uh, from their original uh, offer. And I can also say 100 percent sure that the Kham regime there had tried everything possible to interfere the academic freedom here in the U.S. Now, people say, particularly business people I speak to here in the United States, China is getting better because of the economic exchange. Our values are being conveyed and human rights are and will improve. Is that true? Well, this is a groundless uh, assumption. I even don't believe this is the rhetoric from dissident Chinese. I think this is a kind of excuse made up by the politician on the U.S. side who want to make business in China. The Chinese economy to the outside seemed to be booming or uh, made great progress, but the vast majority of people live in a rural area, which is 70 percent of the population. My experience is that living of those people had a little improvement, if any. Very recent happening in a northern Herbie province that 
a farmer who got uh, illness in his legs and he couldn't afford visiting a uh, doctor or medication and he eventually cut off his own legs with a saw. So that's a tragedy and which is perhaps a window to many, many poor people in China's rural area. This is a good example to tell the world that China is divided into a rich party and poor people. Do you want to go back? Will you go back? And what should be the U.S. position towards China, in your opinion, if you could set policy? The most important is to insist on its universal values, a principle of human rights, freedom of expression, democracy, constitutionalism, and only in this that you can see good things will happen there. I want to emphasize that the Chinese people have realized their rights and their future is in their hand. They have gradually overcome the fear and to determine to do something. So I would say very important political change will be happening in China. The U.S. side must be prepared right now to welcome a changing China. Mm. Do, you, do you see religious expression as a part of that changing China? And what is the state of religious freedom? We get letters all the time from people in China, Catholics particularly, who are uh, persecuted is a mild term for it. Mm -hmm. There is no such a kind of freedom of religion in China because the, all the churches controlled by the communist regime and even the ordinary mass procedures were also under the control of the communist regime. Mm -hmm. And many churches have been demolished in China this year. And many uh, religious people have been persecuted just because of their religion uh, belief, uh, including Catholic and many other denominations. The reality is today is that the ruling Communist Party is in the business of control the thought and thinking. So in that sense, we must follow the good example what former President Reagan said. We must dump the communist regime and the communism to the trash. Let me ask you about being at Catholic University now. Mm -hmm. What is life like? Are you enjoying it? And what has it been like for your family? I enjoy the greatest freedom I ever had, and I can do anything I wanted to do without any problem at all. My family had enjoyed a very happy life now with the support of Catholic University of America and with the Spoon Institution. I'm grateful for all of that. How do you continue your fight for religious freedom? So many of your family members and, and friends, communities, it's still there. As long as we are determined to plant the seeds, even on this side of the global village, and we can see the harvest on the other side of the global village, determination is the most important thing. The Barefoot Lawyer, A Blind Man's Fight for Justice and Freedom in China by Chen Guangcheng, is available at bookstores and online.